Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. We believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That's why we are so honored today to have our guest. He is the current mayor for the city of Swift Current in the province of Saskatchewan. Please help me welcome Mayor Al Bridal. Al, welcome to the show. Well, I'm, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Chris. So, Al, uh, I'm going to start with the first question I've asked every single politically elected leader, and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? You know, I, I, I've thought about that actually for quite some time, and I, it's, it's always kind of been inside me. But really, when I think back about it, uh, we, we grew up, or I grew up in Saskatchewan here, and there were six of us kids, and we didn't have a lot of money. We had a mom and dad. We had lots of love. But uh, I think the dirty to serve came from being that household. Uh, uh, I would have to shovel walks and cut grass and wash dishes and vacuum floors, and, and each one of us children had the same... Uh, we just sort of intermixed all these jobs. And I think the idea is that um, my community as a whole could just be my family. In order to have a good family, we all have to help out. And so I think my duty to serve actually came from my parents and my family upbringing. Was politics always in the cards for Al or was it something that came later on in life? Because I know you were first elected in 2020, but was some, was politics ever discussed at the dinner table or was it something that was taboo and just not discussed and you decided to get it involved later on? No, actually, I came uh, I came from a very uh, religious family. My, my father is a minister. And uh, but uh, at the supper, the dinner table, we would talk religion, we would talk politics, uh, we would talk federal politics, provincial. Uh, growing up in Moose Jaw, we would talk about uh, Moose Jaw politics, and uh, and then we moved to Toronto and Toronto politics. So no, very much. Uh, my parents have a huge, uh, uh, huge hand in me being interested. And you're right, I was just elected as mayor in 2020, but the first time I was elected was back in the early 90s. I was elected to the school board here for six years and then uh, from the school board i uh, i ran after in my first term i actually ran for the provincial uh, uh, progressive conservatives um, and uh, i came in a strong second but that's still a loss to an ndp uh, uh, candidate here and uh, and then um, after the six years of school board i went on to serve six years as a city councillor well first as an alderman then a councillor and then i took a break from politics uh, from being in politics, not being interested, because always interested. And then I, just before my mayor here, I served four years on uh, on the uh, uh, Chinook uh, Regional um, uh, School Board in the Southwest here. So I've, I've been involved uh, a fair bit in my life. I, I love this these types of conversation because as I say in my interviews, I try not to do research on my guests because I like to learn from them about who they are. And if I do the research, then my listeners and viewers may not understand what I know. So I'm glad that you told me about that because I knew you were first elected mayor in 2020. But I want to go back to that very first election back in the 90s when you ran for school board for a second, if that's OK. And I, I know yeah. that's a few years ago, but I want to throw uh, throw back. What got you involved? What made you decide, OK, this this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to run and I'm going to run for school board because you could have chosen many different uh, realms. You could have chosen provincial, which you later, ultimately did later. You could have chosen uh, federal. But you said, OK, let's do school board. What was the decision based on for that of getting involved in elected politics? Well, this, the school, the first school board election was actually similar to this mayor election. Things were going on in the school system that I wasn't happy with. And I had children involved and uh, and I I wanted to go and make a difference. And it's no different than running for mayor uh, two years ago or two and a half years ago. There are things going in my in my city here that things were happening that I, I wasn't happy with and I thought we could do a better job with. And so for both times back just a few years ago and back over 30 years ago, I wanted to make a difference. And when I ran for school board, I wanted to make a difference in my children's lives and their friends' lives and our, and our community at the time. 
We always remember the first time seeing your name on the ballot because it's a surreal experience in itself because you go into that voting booth, you're by yourself and you look at the card and you put an X or a check mark or whatever mark you make beside your name. What was that experience like for you in that very first election? And does that feeling that you get when you go in still carry over to this current election that you just went through in 2020? Every time I go in and put my X or my check at my name, it's the same feeling. It's like, um, I mean, it might sound silly, but I go to check and I'm going, I'm doing this for the right reason. I'm already worthy, but the name's already here. So I, I have to do it. Right. And I, I've won, uh, I've won uh, a few elections. I've lost a few elections too. I, I lost in the provincial uh, election. And I also lost uh, the third time I tried to be a city councilor. I actually lost by 14 votes, but it's still a loss. And so, yeah, every time you go to check it, uh, this time when I went for mayor, there is myself and another name there. And I looked, I went, really? And it's just kind of a, yeah, so real experience actually. A humbling experience for me. You seem like someone who has had an extensive history in their community, whether it be school board, whether it be running provincially, whether it be running for council. You seem to, you must get elected a lot because you must have a pulse on the community. Going into that last election, that 2020 election for a second, I want to know. With your history and your experience of knowing your community, when you were out door knocking, did you hear issues that you were surprised to be hearing about, whether it be micro issues or macro issues, or because of your extensive history in the community, you kind of knew what you were going to get at the door, or were you shocked at some of them? Well, a couple things. It was COVID, so there wasn't much door knocking. It was it was mainly it was mainly kind of seeing people on the street with our masks on. And I didn't I actually didn't go knock on anybody's door because I didn't want to bother anybody during COVID. So we did quite an extensive Facebook campaign, which I had other people do, not this old gray haired guy, but Facebook and uh, and uh, and multimedia stuff, and then just seeing people in the street. And there were there were quite a few things I was surprised about. I I. I ran on a fiscal responsibility, you know, the old conservative fiscal responsibility thing. And I ran on that and there was concerns about that. But then there was also other concerns that uh, people brought forward of uh, they felt they had been treated unfairly in different situations and not just in not just in taxation, but in other issues. And, And I was quite I was quite surprised and unfairly on how they were allowed to or not allowed to say rent a rent a city facility. And uh, that bothered me. And I was quite surprised at that. And then the other really surprising thing when you're running or this last time when I ran, it's right during the provincial election. And so many people, you know, well, which party do you represent? Well, <laughs> I don't represent any party. I am I am representing myself. I'm trying to represent Swift Current because in Saskatchewan, we do not have parties like in, say, in BC or, or I mean, Toronto, they kind of, you know. Go back, they, yeah. <laughs> Quebec. And so, uh, yeah, so um, I was quite surprised. I was surprised at people. People wanted fairness from the city and they felt they weren't getting it. That kind of surprised me. And then the other thing with the provincial politics, they would start talking to me about provincial issues like health care. And I would always let them talk. And then I'd say, you know, we really need to be taking that with up with our provincial uh, people that are running uh, in, in this in this area. And so, uh, yeah. So I want to I want to jump in on that for a second because I I I I know because I used to work in municipal politics. I used to work for a city in a town in northern Alberta, and I used to work in Saskatchewan in Lloydminster. I know that cities are the front lines of politics. You are you can't go to Regina or Ottawa to do your job. You have to be in your community as mayor, as councillor, twenty four seven because you are there to represent your community and you are there to uh, move your city forward. But your residents will come to you from time to time and ask you about provincial or federal issues and whether it be passport offices, whether it be healthcare or education. And you as mayor may from time to time want to pass the buck and say, it's not our issue. It's a provincial issue, but the resident won't look at it that way. They'll look at it as a, it's a swift current issue. This is an issue that's facing our community. And as mayor, you have to address it. Have you been finding that over the last two and a half years since you've been elected mayor? 
Yes, I actually have. Uh, and I mean, I, I'm very careful when I, I like to listen to the citizens of Swift Current and let them say their piece. Uh, whatever it might be. And even though instead of me jumping in, just listen to their issues about the passport office or the fact that they, they can't get their child over here from the Philippines and the problems there are with our federal government and listen to the health care issues. And I listen to it. And if I can help, if I know who to go to, quite often I'll say, listen, our, our local uh, MP, uh, this is his name and this is his number, or our local, local MLA, and he happens to be, our local MLA happens to be the uh, uh, ministry minister for for uh, mental health and addictions and seniors health and rural health care. And so lots of these issues. And I do, I don't sidestep it, but I, I don't just say, no, that's not our problem. You just deal with him. I'll listen. I talk. And then like with the passport stuff, uh, just being around for a long time, you hear lots of stuff and I'll say, you know, why don't you go to this agency and have them help you? Uh, maybe go to, uh, I mean, sometimes um, there's all sorts of different social um, programs in our city uh, for, for families and stuff. There's a family resource center. When I hear them talk about certain things, you know, maybe you should go there. There's a newcomer center. You're having issues with your passport, having issues getting your child over from the Philippines or from India. Um, this is, you know, if you went and talked to Ikashana, if you went and talked to Sarah, if you went and talked to Lorraine. And so that's being a, a local resident. That's a huge help. And I still, in a sense, I, I put it off because it isn't my responsibility, but I don't just cut them off. I listen and then try to give them direction. And I mean, sometimes I've taken people right from the office here and walked them over to the uh, new people to our community. I've walked them over to our uh, newcomers welcome center that's a half a block away on a nice summer day. And I say, here it is, just come in here and these people will help you. And so that's, it's small town. I mean, it's Swift Current small town. Uh I want to go back to that uh, election in 2020 here for a second before we switch gears to talk about Swift Current as a whole. And I want to know, being elected mayor is a unique entity that not a lot of people in your community have had the opportunity to be. For you, when that blue check mark or that X beside your name came out and you were officially declared mayor-elect for the city of Swift Current, what goes through your head at that moment? Um, many things, uh, <laughs> elation, obviously, no, no elation, but then what have I done? Um, am I really up for this task? And even though you plan for it and, uh, and then, uh, humility, I'll be really honest because so many other people in my community thought that I could, I could do a good job as mayor because the mayor is very unique. We are, the mayor only has one vote in any council. I mean, Ontario is a little different now with their super strong mayor powers, but most of us, the mayor just has one vote. And yet the mayor is the spokesperson for councils, the spokesperson for the city. And I wanted to make sure that I represent our citizens and our council and our city uh, inside the city and outside the city in the best way possible. So that, I mean, of course, when you win anything, it's wonderful. And then you lay in bed that night, you go, oh, Oh, what did I do? <laughs> and I'm I'm 65 years old now. And I know my wife said I was planning to retire from my construction job. I mean, I had a construction company, and my wife said, "You're the only guy I know that decides he's going to retire from his construction company and then gets into politics and becomes a mayor. Not just politics, becomes a mayor." And you just, um, anyway. So it's it's quite a uh, yeah. It was, there's all sorts of emotions and and feelings. Does that does that feeling go away though? Because you're you're two years into your term, and there are I'm assuming issues that have come forward to the city of Swift Current that you have been prepared for. But sometimes you get the odd curveball, and you have to do your due diligence. You have to research. You have to be prepared. You have to be educated on the issues that are in front of you. How do you, as mayor, look at the issues that are presented in front of council and make sure you are making the best decision that will move the city forward as a whole? Because at the end of the day, you have to make sure you get it right, because if not, you're affecting your families, your neighbors, the businesses in your uh, communities. How important is it for you to be educated and get things right? Well, um, I'd like to think I get everything right, but that would be a lie. OK, but uh, the best thing any of us on council can do is do do our due diligence. We read uh, at council. At council meetings, we have a packet that comes out with information and we read that information. And after you read the report of uh, administrative staff and you read the report and then I always go somewhere else and find more information. 
And I know some of my counselors do too. I don't know if they all do, but I know some do. And just to reconfer, just to make sure I'm very satisfied with what my admin is telling me. And so, um, yeah, so well, be well prepared and well read. And I, I read the news. I mean, I read the news every day. I'm a news town, always have been. I read the news every day. I read municipal news, uh, whether it's out of Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton. I read as much as I can. And because uh, anything that happens here in Swift Current, it's not the only place in the world that's happened. It's always happened elsewhere. And so if you can just keep on top of that, uh, quite often, uh, quite often when a new bylaw comes in here, uh, we will look to other cities that have passed a similar bylaw and see how it's worked for them. And so then listen to admin and then do my own research and go on and read the news stories about what the new cat bylaw on Saskatoon and how it affected Saskatoon. I mean, that might sound silly, but sometimes people are very, uh, you know, cats and they're very, very, um, uh, I'm not sure the word I should use. Very uh, uh, divisive, yeah, if you ask. Passionate. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, passionate <laughs> about cats and cats on the loose. And so, uh, so, and then the other thing that happens at council too, um, I have to when when we're discussing it as 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 a council, and I have, and I'm a I'm an opinionated guy. It's it's, and everybody knows me. They know I'm opinionated. That's but you know what. Um, I need to sit back and listen and not just let someone talk, but listen and hear what they say. And there's been, I'm not going to say many, many times, but I guarantee there's been half a dozen or seven times at council when I was sure I was going to vote a certain way. And I sat and listened to my counselors talk and I thought, you know what, they have a really good point. And, uh, and, and Do you so think that makes you a better mayor? Do you think that makes you a better mayor or looking at other p uh, mayors, do you say to other mayors and say, you know what, sometimes you can't be so in cement about where the way you think you're going to vote because someone may have a better idea or a better opinion that may neglect, neglect everything that you think is right. I, I believe, I believe it definitely makes me a better mayor to, to listen to people and to not just hear their words, but actually listen to their opinions. And like I say, I'm a, I'm a free enterprise. I'm, I mean, I ran for the conservatives. I mean, you know, I mean, having a look at me, I mean, the chances of me voting NDP, it'd be like slim to none yet. Um, some of your council comes forward with a bit of a socialist idea. And sometimes I think about that and I think, you know, that's, that's a good solution for our, for our citizens. And I'm going to have to change my rigid uh, uh, and uh, my rigid thought here, and and think about that. And so that's something I believe it does make me better a better mayor. And uh, having having good discussion at council and good discussion before council definitely makes us all better politicians. And, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because you, we, earlier on you talked about the whole party system and how Saskatchewan yeah. doesn't have it at the municipal level. As mayor, you can't care if someone's a conservative or an NDP or a liberal or a green or a whatever party they belong to, because at the end of the day, everyone's a swift current resident, whether they vote red, blue, green, purple, orange, burgundy or whatever. Right. That's correct. Yeah. No, I, I can't. I, I can. I guess I can't care, but I can't have that influence me because uh, every one of our citizens is a citizen of swift current, whether they no matter what political party they belong to, uh, if they belong to any, no matter whether they voted for me or voted against me, or no matter whether they voted or not. Because, I mean, last election, not even 40% of the people voted. So that means, you know, six six out of 10 people, just they don't care or, or whatever, whatever word you want to use there. But And yet these are still our citizens and we have a responsibility to make decisions in their best interest. So I want to turn to segment two now. And before I do this, I want to preface this question with this following statement. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not an opinion of council. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is his opinion talking to the host of the cross border interviews. Al, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Swift current today as of recording? Oh, you know, there's going to be a couple here, and uh, 
I mean, we could always talk finances, we could talk all sorts of things, but I think the biggest thing facing the city of Swift and facing many other municipalities, and I just, I talked about it briefly just before, but it's actually apathy. Um, it's, uh, it concerns me when people don't want to get out and vote. It concerns me when they don't, uh, when our citizens aren't engaged with what we're doing here as a city. We, we had a, uh, uh, we built a strategic plan here about a, within the last year, we built a new strategic plan for Swift Current and we'd ask people to engage. And uh, I think out of 16,780 residents, we had uh, less than 600 engaged with us and the people, the people running the, the, uh, the engagement said, oh, that's that's a good number. Like Regina had Regina had a question out there. Regina out of their 140 some thousand or 50 some thousand people, they had less than a thousand people engaged on something. But so apathy and um, the city's going to do what they want anyway. So why should I vote? Uh, um, the council will just do whatever they want. They'll just push through tax increases. Why should I bother? And so that's a real that's one. And then the other thing, and it, it sounds it's similar, but it's selfishness of people. And they, they want to make sure they want to make sure their taxes are low, but it's okay if the guy beside him has higher taxes because he's got a bigger house or he's richer or, or there's more of the, I mean, so this, this selfish, so selfishness in our society and apathy are the two things that I think are the most dangerous to our municipality and all other municipalities. I really do. So I want to talk about apathy here for a second, because I'm very glad someone has brought this up finally. After almost 500 episodes of this show, I'm glad someone's finally talking about apathy. You're right. The voting numbers in this this country are abysmal. And I say that with all due respect. The fact that only 40% of the population will go out and vote is scary. In BC, it was even 29% in some communities. How do you change that, though? Because you're right. People will say, I don't care. Council's going to do what they want. How do you as mayor, because you're the, at le- you're the chair of this council, you're the chair of the, you're the head of this city. How do you see your role as mayor of the city of Swift Current in changing that apathy? Because it must be challenging when people are, their mindset is so set in the idea that my uh, voice and my opinion doesn't matter. I think, um, I think as councils or as this council, we need to do a better job of educating our citizens. We need to make sure the information is out there. There's so many ways. Like, I mean, in the old days, you got the news at at six and the news at ten, and now they get news all day long. And uh, and people were more engaged. 35, 40, 45 years ago than they are today. I think there's so much stuff out there, but somehow we have to uh, get, find a way that we can reach not just old codgers like me, but reach the young people, uh, reach the middle-aged and reach them through, and maybe through our hockey rinks, like our indoor hockey rinks, maybe our outdoor hockey rinks, do some advertising there. I mean, we're running Facebook and Twitter, and I'm not sure what else, uh, some other messenger, something at the city here, which I don't do any of, trust me. I mean, I, I'm on there, but somebody, I, I tell them what to put on, and they put on. But I think we need to do a better job of getting information out there. So education, and then when, I'm, when we're talking to people, uh, actually listen to them. When, when we ask for their opinion and they tell us their opinion, don't just dismiss it. Actually say, I mean, you can say, that's a great opinion. You know what I mean? Or, or you don't have to agree with everything, but um, thank you for your opinion. That's not my opinion, but thank you for it. We'll make sure we record this so that everybody can, can see that you had that opinion. Because I think in the past, we send out, I mean, even for this, uh, you know, this... Um, where the 600 people responded. I mean, did they just only 600 respond because they said it was all about recreation and what we want for the future. And I mean, so council's got their mind made up anyway. So why should I waste my time telling them that I think a swimming pool is important or I think drama is important or I think uh, a cross country trap, whatever it might be. So I believe as elected people, we need to listen to our citizens one at a time and then groups of them. And, uh, and I mean, that's all I can say. I know, one of my lawyer friends, he always calls me the eternal optimist because I, I believe 
I believe in the good of people. I really do. And I, and uh, he says, no, no. And he's a lawyer. So, I mean, you can imagine, but, uh, but anyway, any rate, uh, um, I really think we need to do a better job educating our public and a better job getting, when we make decisions at council, make sure the public know those decisions. Uh, and it's not just at tax time. It's, it's, uh, how we're going to run the pool, the outdoor pool, the indoor pool, and try to get that information out to people so that they can. Uh, uh, and then the other thing, too, I mean, when we're talking apathy, all cities, I'm sure other cities, too, we have a, a great big number of boards and committees uh, around city council, be it library, um, library. Uh, we have a WHL team here and, and we have a vested, the city citizens have a vested interest in our Swift Farm Broncos. And so one of our one of our, uh, me our council members sits on that. And then we also have public that sit on that and we appoint public to different boards. And we need to, we need to not have the same people on those boards all the time. And it's really tough because you need 40 appointments and 37 of them were from last year. You know what I mean? And somehow we need to get this idea that um, Mr. Smith doesn't have to be on the library board just because he's been there for the last 42 years. You know, Sally Johnson can go on. And so I know that um, I've been trying, uh, I have to, uh, there's a provincial housing authority in town here and it's a provincial board, but I am the nominated committee. The mayor of a city is a nominated committee for a provincial board. It's, it's goofy, but, and so I actively went out and engaged people and I would, I would call them up and I'd say, uh, Maureen, I think you'd be good at this. You know, you spent your years as a nurse, you retired now, and they need somebody of, of your caliber on this board. So anyway, I think as, as councillors, as, as mayor, we need to do more of that and try to get more of our citizens involved, not always the same person doing two or three different committees. And these committees don't pay squat, like 50 bucks, 100 bucks a crack, sometimes nothing. And so it's not a big financial thing, but we need, we need to have more of our citizens engaged more of our citizens engaged in more things that we're doing. On the flip side here, Mayor, and I'm just gonna yes. I'm gonna ask the political uh -huh. question here, and I'm not I don't want to go into the political route because I, I hate doing it, but I hear from municipalities like yours and like other communities across Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC that 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 600 people, and I'm not picking, I'm just saying 600 people because you talk yeah. about this recreational survey. Those are the, the vocal minority. Those are the ones who are saying, you know what, we need, we have issues and we need them addressed now, whether it be X, Y, or Z. The silent majority are okay. The silent majority is thinking to themselves, as long as my garbage is picked up, my water turns on when I turn on my tap and my ta taxes are low, I really could care two craps about what's going on because I'm comfortable the way things are right now. How do you balance that? Because I guarantee you, you know, there's about 10 people in your community. I'm not naming names here, but there's 10 people in your communities. No matter what decision you make, you will hear from them. If good, bad, or ugly, you'll always hear from them. How do you balance the, the people who want to engage, whether it be good, bad, or ugly, with the people who are comfortable with just saying, you know what? I'm comfortable with the way the city is going because my water's picked, my water's turned on, my garbage is picked up, and my road in front of my house is paved. Oh, it's it's difficult, <laughs> but uh, and you know the ten people that call, no matter what decisions is made. Um, I listened to the uh, the ex mayor of Edmonton. I can't think of his name. He did Don Iverson. That's it. I went to a thing and he seemed, he was so, oh man, the guy was, the guy's got more energy than I can't even, can't even begin to tell you how much energy this guy has. But he was talking about, you know, the problem citizen and they call him, they, and they, I was going to use the word bix, that's not a proper word, but the, 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 the they complain and, and they diss and that. And, and he said, you know, over the years, he found if he actually listened to those people, quite often they would have some gems inside their complaining. And, and not, not always, but quite often. And, and they would have a, they would have, so anyway, he was just saying at this thing, it was, I think it was in Saskatoon last year, he was there. He was just saying, even these people that complain all the time, we need to sit and listen. And, and you know, I had one just last week, I had a citizen come to my office and I, it was about uh, taxation and, and assessment. And, and I had my mind made up because I've known the citizen for a long time. And, and yet, before he came in, I said, you know what, I, I am going to listen. 
And I sat and listened. And you know what? He brought up a couple of really good points, points that I haven't thought of that nobody else. And so, and I go back to, uh, I go back to the mayor of Edmonton and just, we need to listen to what these citizens say. And then also the people that complain all the time or always have an opinion, you're right. They are the vocal minority, but there's other people that um, they're very happy having their garbage picked up, the streets cleaned. And, and we also have to understand, and I mean, right now in our, in our city, we're looking at, we've had lots of uh, uh, people wanting a, a new aquatic center here. And it's very expensive and we've applied to some federal grants. And if we don't get them, we can't afford it. If we do get them, we can't afford it. So, <laughs> but, um, and like, is that, and we could use a new aquatic center. We have one that's functioning, but it's older. It's like 40, I think it's 42 years old now. And uh, things are falling apart and we need to repair. And, uh, but you have to still consider, okay, so say the tax increase had to be 12 or 14%. Is that fair to all our citizens as we have current? And uh, just because a small number really want it. Is that fair to the other 17,000 or 16,000? So I, I do weigh that when I'm thinking about this stuff. There's no doubt. So the last question on this segment before we turn to the last one, because I'm cautious of time here, Al. Um, if I go to the Swift Current tomorrow and I go ask 100 people that exact same question that I started this segment off, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Swift Current today? They're going to tell me some macro issues. They're going to tell me healthcare. They're going to tell me maybe education. They may tell me infrastructure. But then they're going to talk about the micro issues. I need a new park in my area. I need a pothole fixed in front of my house. How do you as mayor and council look at the micro issues that are important to the people of your community and dissect them in a way that you make sure that no one feels left behind, but everyone is also getting their fair share of the taxes that they're paying? Because I can imagine you only can collect a certain amount of taxes and you only have a certain amount of money to do projects every year. Some things are going to get forgotten or some things are going to have to wait till next year or the year after. How do you as mayor and council look at the issues and go, okay, this year Johnny's sidewalk isn't going to be paved because it's not important because Samantha's sidewalk is a lot worse. How do you pick the winners and losers? Oh, I just blame that on administration. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just, I, just, yeah, that, I know you're, just, I know you're joking. Just, I, no, but you know, um, again, um, I'm, I'm amazed at when you sit and listen to people, and then you lay out the rationale why their sidewalk wasn't done. Okay, and, and we'll say, you know what, every sidewalk in Swift Current, our engineering staff goes around once every five years and actually looks, inspects at every sidewalk. And your sidewalk, I know it's bad, but it's not as bad as Sally's sidewalk. And this year we only have so much money and uh, Sally's sidewalk's getting done. Yours is on the list for the next year or two down the road, but right now it's not. And, I, and when you tell them, when you explain that to them, most people actually understand. The potholes are a different issue. The potholes, I mean, they come, they go. Well, no, they come, they come, they come. <laughs> and, and it's funny, um, so many times we spend way too much time arguing that it shouldn't be done when it would have been cheaper just to go do it. And, and I've seen that. And so one of the things that I've done as mayor is I've really stressed the fact when we have a legitimate complaint, instead of telling people why we're not going to fix their pothole, most times, I mean, we have the staff, we have the material. Most times it's cheaper to drive over to uh, Fourth and, and Sydney and put the pavement in the pothole, tamp it in and, and be done with it. And it just is. And uh, I've always been a firm believer, um, just just get stuff done, you know? Anyway, so we, we kind of, you kind of listen both ways. You explain some of the bigger projects, you explain why they can't have it because we are spending money uh, this year we're going to reclad the. This year we're going to reclad and and insulate the stockade building where the kids play soccer, volleyball. Uh, uh, what's that? Uh, not tennis, but the other uh, pickleball. The old, pickleball, thank you, pickleball. <laughs> and yeah, all the old people. And and we're going to spend uh, we're going to spend about four hundred thousand dollars on that. And we're, if we're doing that, we can't afford to do this other. So 
And people are are accepting of that as long as you have an explanation and you listen to them, right? That's right. You listen and you have an explanation. And some there's always the odd one that isn't, but I mean, you, you can't you can't please them all. Screw the hat. I want to turn to segment three now, and this is my favorite segment of the show because I get to learn about the tourist hotspots of the communities that I'm speaking to. Because as a tourist who likes to spend his tourism dollars in Canada, I've made a pledge that I will be visiting your community if you come on my show. So I will be in Swift Current later this year. So, Al, what are some of the hidden gems that people should visit in the city of Swift Current, if they are tourists coming through your community? Well, I've, I've written some of these down, so I didn't forget them, okay? So I'm going to read a few here, okay? But, uh, okay, uh, of course, around our community, we have uh, Provincial Park to the north and three, three regional parks all within, like, half an hour or so. And that does, a, like, you know, you go to lake and you jet ski and you fish and all that sort of stuff. So that's all around us. And lots of other cities in Canada. You go to Alberta and, I mean, uh, how many cities in Alberta can go four different directions and be fishing in, in 20 minutes or half an hour? Very few. We can. We can. I mean, go to Montreal. I was down in Montreal years ago, and the taxi driver loved to fish. And he would he would take a long weekend, and he would drive for four or five hours up to this favorite fishing spot. Just so he could go fix, fish or catch some perch. And I'd say, you know what? I can just slip half an hour south and I can catch perch. I know exactly where they are. And if I go 35 minutes southwest, I can catch perch. He goes, really? I said, yeah. I mean, it, so that's fantastic for our city, for outdoors people and parks. But anyway, back to our city. Um, right here, we have uh, kind of our newest attraction is an 18-hole disc golf and course. And we have had enthusiasts come from all across um not just Saskatchewan, Western Canada. We'd had nine holes and then and then they put on a big competition last year and they came out of Alberta and Manitoba and BC to come play. And it's down along our creek. And if you like, if you ever played disc golf, I've only played it a few times. One of my counselors plays it almost every day. He's a he's a media guy like you, so he's got more time than me. <laughs> no, but <laughs> sorry, sorry, taking my shots. But Joking, anyway, so go the, for it. Tack the media. It's what we do in this 2023. Come on, Al. Yeah. But I mean, so that that uh, that that disc golf course is, uh, you know, um, it's it's quite unique, and it's down along. We have a, we have over 22 kilometers of pathway through our city that we have. Uh, um, it's called the Chinook Pathway, and it wanders all from every corner of our city. And uh, this this uh, this disc course is on the south side of town, and it wanders meanders along the pathway. And you have to when you're walking, there's signs up be you know beware of flying discs if you're walking because people might be crossing over with a shot. We have that. That, we have two golf courses. We have a, a, a private golf course called Elmwood here, and then we have Chinook, which is city course. They're both 18 hole. Uh, both courses are, I mean, for prairie courses, they're wonderful. I, I always, I, I hear, I'm, I used to golf, but I have them for 20 some years, but I just talked to a guy the other day. Uh, I was talking to him. I don't even know where he's from. I was about my business. I think he was, uh, I think he might have been from Winnipeg. And he said, man, I stopped in. What a great place. I just loved your two golf courses. So both golf courses, and they're they're great golf courses, but they also, even the private club allows just people to show up and, and use a restaurant and lounge. So on a nice summer night, sometimes my wife and I will just, we'll go to one of the restaurants or, or we'll go with a couple of friends and, and just sit in the lounge and look over the golf course and have a, have a drink or a tea or a coffee. And, and we can sit out on the deck. You can sit inside behind glass. So those golf courses are good. I mean, we have the Living Sky Casino if you're a gambler. And I mean, it's, uh, you know, I don't mind gambling at all a little bit, but I mean, some people love it. We have the Ted Knight Saskatchewan Hockey Hall of Fame, which is uh, connected to our um, Innovation Iplex, which is our big rink that the WHL uh, Broncos play at. And so that's open, uh, that's open <coughs> year round in the afternoons. We've got the Swift Current Museum, the Mennonite Heritage Village, and I'm not sure where you're from, Chris. I see your last name, Brown. That could be English or it could be Brawn and be Mennonite. But I, I mean, it's somebody changed in your family line. But the the uh, the Mennonite Heritage Village is, <coughs> is out at our Ag and X grounds, and it's quite a unique uh, uh, unique place to go, especially if they got uh, pie and sometimes they have. Uh, 
uh, what is it, roll kuchen and uh, those deep fried bread, roll kuchen and uh, sunflower seeds. And anyway, it's quite a, quite a thing to go to. We have an art gallery here. And I know an art gallery isn't for everybody, but we just have a little art gallery and they, they bring people in for a month at a time. And it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a place to see. Um, of course, we have shopping. So we have stuff along the highway and then downtown. We've had a lot of young people this last um, five, ten years that are opening up little shops downtown. And there's, uh, um, you know, shoe shops and little dress shops and uh, jewelry, you know, like and, and just all sorts of things. And that's quite a uh, um, uh, quite an attraction. I know that several of my daughter's friends from Calgary, they love coming here and going downtown and just hitting all these little shops. And then in the summertime, uh, we have Market Square every Saturday, uh, which is uh, uh, farmers market, uh, food vendors, and local entertainment. It's like a uh, like a summer party every Saturday downtown. From I think it starts. I better get this right. I know it's a. I think it starts kind of the first week in June and goes right into the long weekend in September, I believe. And uh, and it's, uh, I mean, there's literally thousands of people go downtown every day for the, or I mean, every Saturday for this. Um, uh, the other tourist attraction, we have the Windscape Kite Festival, which runs the same time as a Long Day's Night Music Festival. So that's uh, when we have the longest uh, longest day of the year. We have a three-day music festival, and then SAS Power puts uh, uh, SAS Power uh, is a big sponsor for this big kite festival. And there's kite flyers from all across North America. There's always one or two from like New Zealand, Australia, Britain, and that's always good. But that's uh, towards the end of uh, towards the end of June there. And then uh, where else here? Uh, then, our, of course, our Frontier Days Rodeo and Fair that I mentioned, that's at the very end of June. First, it used to be, the, we used to be called the Frontier City. And then somebody thought, uh, you know, when they rebranded, we should be where wife or where life makes fence. No, where life makes sense. My friends always say where wife makes fence, <laughs> my farm friends. But, uh, but anyway, the Ag and Ax, it's a great, it's a great four day event. And, uh, and that Mennonite uh, Heritage Village is over on that same grounds there. And then uh, also in the summertime, the Lyric Theater puts on, Lyric Theater is right on the Main Street. It's an old actual, it was a theater and then became like an actual theater. Then it became a movie house and then a bar and now it's changed back to a theater. And they put on quite a few musical events and some plays in there. And in the summertime, the last few summers, they've been doing Shakespeare in the Park under a big tent over at our Riverside Park on the south side. Now, I mean, if you're coming in the summertime, you're going to have to miss our Swift Crump Broncos. But I mean, uh, we also have a uh, we also have a baseball club called the uh, 57s, <clears throat> and they play regularly all through the summertime. And they play in that WCB, so Western Canadian Baseball League. I think that's what it is. And they're fun to watch. I like going to their games. We have drag racing out the airport about. I think drag racing is three times a year. Uh, we have stock car racing. Uh, there's always some rodeo events. We used to host, you know, the CCA finals rodeo. We don't anymore, but we have, we have uh, different rodeo events. Um, it sounds like to, your community yeah. is such a vibrant bubbling oh. of always something going on. There, there's always, and, and the curling, I mean, you mentioned the curling club. We, we've hosted, we've hosted the ladies worlds a couple times here in Swift Current. And this year we're hosting the Canadian Mixed Championships in November this year. And uh, uh, which is a, a huge thing. So anyway, there's just, there's every, and then, I mean, if you like, if you like other, like if you like kids, baseball, soccer, lacrosse, hockey, every weekend during the summer, during the, uh, during the winter, there's a tournament somewhere going on, it seems, with, I mean, I have grandkids playing, I got grandkids playing soccer, and I got grandkids dancing, and there's always something to do, so, uh, yeah, but uh, it's, there's lots, there's lots and lots to do, and I know a local resident say, oh, that's old and boring, but I like to sit down and watch a good baseball game. I like to go watch a good hockey game. If it's my seven-year-old grandson playing, it's lots of fun, or if it's the Broncos, so. So many, many things. So anyway, I'd like to talk too long. I'm sorry there. No, God, hey, if if you didn't talk, it would be a very bad interview. Like if you just gave one word answers, it'd be very bad. But you kind of answered it already, but I want to make sure I get this on the record. Where do you, what do you do? What do you do to decompress after a long council meeting or a hard day at work? Is there a place in the city that you go and just get away from everything and just decompress? And before you answer, 
I'm going to say the same thing I say to every other mayor and Reeve and counselor. You can't say your own house. While it's in your city, you can't say your own house. <laughs> what actual <laughs> building or event or uh, space? Is there a local watering hole you go to just to get away and just, you know what? All your cares just wash away after that moment. Well, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, I, I have... I have my house written down here, but but I knew you'd want more than that. I, I knew you'd want more than that. So actually there's a, I mean, you know, I mentioned the golf courses earlier in the summertime. They're a really nice place, especially on a beautiful summer evening. But we have a, a place downtown here called the Acropole Restaurant. It's a Greek restaurant. He's got a little lounge on the side. And I mean, when you're here, you need to go try the Acropole Restaurant. And uh, it's just a nice place. And I meet some friends down there. We have a Houston pizza here in town. And for whatever reason, um, I've been going to Houston pizza for, no oh, man, it must be 15, 20 years. And, you know, it might be once a month. It might be a couple of times a month and just meet some friends there. And, and just like you say, decompose press um there's a k motel out on the west and a town actually in the rm but it's a nice place to do the same uh you know there's you know all i mean all the bps and all the other ones there's those places but for me houston pizza or the acropole would be my top two in the winter in the summertime it would have to be one of the golf courses and usually the golf course i usually pick is our regional like our city golf course chinook on the south side so I want to end on this question, and this is the most important question out of the entire interview, and it all gets down to one simple question. And you can take as long as you want to answer this, uh, Al. In your opinion, what makes the city of Swift Current such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, they call it the city of Swift Current, but really, we're just a small town. I can be what makes it so great, I can be anywhere in like, if there's a traffic jam, it takes me seven and a half minutes to get across town. But five minutes, I can be at any one of my grandchildren's soccer games, baseball games, hockey games. I can be, go to see friends. And so the idea that um, it is a small town, and, and Chris, I don't know where you grew up, uh, but when you grow up in a smaller community and people know who you are and you know them, I mean, you you know, like I I ref I ref kids, you know, years ago I ref kids, and now they're they're adults and they're running their own businesses, and they still call me by, uh, you know, Mr. Bridal because I I'd, I'd ref them in soccer, and and uh, and you know they they introduce me as uh, um, they'll say you know Sally this this Mr. Bridal here he used to ref me in soccer he used to coach me in soccer, and so the small town feel. Uh, is huge for me here. I uh, I get to Regina, Saskatoon, and their wonderful cities, but I'm so glad to get home. I you know I fly into Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, and I mean, and I've been in lots and lots of places, and yet when I get home, it's we're comfortable here. We're comfortable, and uh, we're comfortable, and we're friendly, and uh, um, yeah, and I mean we have uh, Swift Current used to be a very um, very white community, I'm going to say, you know, and in the last 10, 12 years, it has become very multicultural. I mean, I think there's over a thousand Filipinos that live right in the city of Swift Current. It's and in the Southwest, there's 2000 in the whole Southwest, but we have so many families have come in. I mean, so many Ukrainian families have come in now, but I mean, we're a friendly city and, you know, some people say, oh, we're snobbish. No, no, we're not. We're a friendly city. And, uh, and that for me, I love the small town feel. I like being friends with people. I like seeing somebody on the street that I recognize and say hi to. And I like the fact that anything that this city has to offer, it doesn't take me an hour, an hour and a half to get to. It takes, even if I walk, heck, if I walk, I can be anywhere in a half an hour. You know, ride my bike, maybe 10, 15 minutes. I take the car, she's five minutes to anywhere. And uh, so, yeah, for me, small town, comfortable. I, I I miss the small town feel so much. As much as I love Calgary, I, I grew up in a small town, rural Ontario, and I moved to a small town in Alberta. So I I, I know what you're talking about, and you paint an amazing a picture. When I, I, it makes me think about home and living in small town uh, Canada again. But thank you so much. 
I want to take a moment and say thank you, Al, for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. I know uh, it's always tough for a mayor to sit down and actually just sit still for 45 minutes. That's not a council meeting, but thank you so much for doing this. I've learned so much, and I can say with all due respect, your community is better off with you at the council table, and I can imagine you have great things ahead for the city of Swift Current, you and council. So I look forward to, A, being in your community later on this year, but also potentially meeting you in the future for just to sit down and have a good coffee or a slice of pizza at Houston's. It, it, it would be my pleasure to actually meet you in person, either at Sumo or in our community. When you're here, if you're going to be here this summer, you make sure you look me up, Chris, because uh, we could uh, I could take you over the Acropole on a nice hot summer day and, and I could show you just how nice it is over there. Or I could take you to the golf course or anything. So please look me up when you're here. It's been my pleasure uh, to uh, to do this interview. Thank you. For sure. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day. Go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.